No, it's Hi, everybody. live on my end. Yeah. <laughs> yep, it's live. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Joanne, Science Goddess on Twitter. And uh, we are here for another episode of Read Science, along with my trusty uh, co-host, Jeff Showmeyer. I was going to call you a sidekick, but that makes you sound <laughs> less than equal to me. So anyway, <laughs> so uh, um, we are joined today by Deborah. Blum, <laughs> we had a long conversation about our last name. Uh, Deborah Blum, uh, who is the author of, uh, well, many books, but I will show you two that most of you are familiar with, The Poisoner's Handbook. Oh my goodness, what year was this, Deborah? It was 2010, if you can believe it. Yeah, like, that's, that's, that's yeah. 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 And, uh, and then her newest book is The Poison Squad, uh, One Chemist Single-Minded, Crusade for Food Safety at the Turn of the 20th Century. So if you want to say hi to our audience. Um, hi, it's great to be here. And, yeah. uh, and, I'm and, looking uh, forward to the conversation. Uh, I am so excited to have you on. I've been wanting, to, you know, waiting for the, the next book and, and just this opportunity to speak to you. So um, let me go ahead and read. If you don't mind, I'll read your bio from the back of the book. That should be the most current, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, Deborah Blum is the director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at NI sorry, MIT and publisher of Undark Magazine. In 1992, she won the Pulitzer Prize for a series on primate research which she turned into a book, The Monkey Wars. Her other books include The Poisoner's Handbook, Ghost Hunters, Love at Goon Park, and Sex on the Brain. She has written for publications including The New York Times, Wired, Time, Discover, Mother Jones, The Guardian, and The Boston Globe, where we find all of our favorite writers, right? That's uh, right. Blum is a past president of the National Association of Science Writers, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a lifetime associate of the National Academy of Sciences. So yes, very esteemed. Welcome. Thank you. Again, it's really great to be here. And I, I've wanted so often to talk books with you all. So this is <laughs> going to yes. be great. It's what we do best. <laughs> <laughs> OK, all right, Jeff, I'm turning it over to you. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to talking about this book with you because I enjoyed it immensely. Before I started reading it, just before I started reading it, I told Joanne I was about ready. And she had finished the book already. She said, oh my gosh, Jeff, she says, you better get ready. There are so many horrible things in there. You'll be puking your guts out. My, my <laughs> Something to that really. effect, yeah. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, that sounds interesting. And it seemed to me sort of to start out with a sort of big overviewish way, these days people think a lot about food additives and quote chemicals in their foods and labeling and how they can read and see these things and what they should eat. And I think we should start by cueing people into just how awful things the situation was in the late 1800s and what sort of horrible things manufacturers thought it was just fine to put in our foods and most of Congress went along with. So if you could tell us a few, you know, horror stories to get us going before we get to, to Harvey. That would be I nice. have an enormous list of horror yeah. stories. People oh. are always saying to me when they read this book that, you know, they kind of hover between horror and nausea <laughs> different yes. places in the book. So I'm sure that's a great way to describe it. So I, when I started this book, I had what I have come to realize was is a kind of fairy tale view of the 19th century mm -hmm where everyone was pink cheeked and healthy and eating wonderful fresh produce and creamy milk and all the good stuff. Uh, which a was libertarian paradise, perhaps, yes. where democracy <laughs> flourished and the people were empowered. The, yeah, that's right. It would make a great novel, right? But in reality, uh, it was nothing like that at all, as, as I came to realize. So, and to put that in just a little context, in the 19th century, we didn't have any consumer protection regulations at all at the federal mm -hmm. level. There was nothing. And there were no requirements to label. There were no requirements to safety tests. There were no requirements to uh, limit what you put into food. So you have this incredible Wild West land landscape of manufactured food, yeah. which coincides with the rise of industrialization. So there are, in fact, 
the rise of manufactured food. And it's within that context that everything gets completely crazy. <laughs> so for instance, I mean, I have a long list of these, but you were quite often in spices, you'd find brick dust mixed in with your cinnamon, the most popular extender for flowers. And, and this is all profit making, right? It's my, flour is expensive, but if I put a little ground gypsum, which we use in wallboard into the flour, then I make a greater profit. So people put ground gypsum into flour. They put uh, uh, charred rope, charred crumbled rope into ground coffee. They put, uh, actually charred and crumbled bone into some ground coffee. They put ground uh, seashells into pepper, right, to simulate the pepper mm -hmm. seeds. They use grass seed instead of strawberry seed and strawberry jam, which could be something that I'd never even seen uh, walking distance of a strawberry. A lot of the strawberry jams or many of the popular ones were just dyed corn syrup dyed with either red lead or a coltar dye um, and then uh, with a little uh, timothy seed which is grass seed right. sprinkled in them to mimic strawberry seeds and then milk was a paradise that was so interesting to me that milk was so bad right so uh, you get whatever farm fresh milk was and which is not pasteurized which raises a whole lot of problems right. there's no refrigeration too so it's a wonderful medium for germs to flourish which they did but then uh for dairymen to make a greater profit they did all kinds of crazy i mean really crazy things mm -hmm. they cut the milk with water then it would turn a grayish blue so they'd mix in chalk or they'd mix in plaster of plaster dust to make it white again and if it seemed too thin they'd add in a little horse hoof gelatin and then if it seemed like it didn't look creamy enough uh, red uh, it's lead chromate which makes a yellow dye they'd add in a little lead dye and then sometimes some parts of the country they would fake cream by pureeing calf brains and floating them on top that's the part that tends to make people super that, crazy that is right? exactly what that's got the me one, right? went, oh my <laughs> No, I'm and, sure the problem, and it so, looked great, right? I mean, I actually read this uh, comment by a doctor at the turn of the 20th is that it looked just like cream. And the only problem was when you poured it in your hot coffee, the little brain chunks cooked. <laughs> and so, at that time, I was like, okay, no milk for me. I had someone say to me, do you still drink milk? And I go, well, not 19th century milk. No. At this point, you couldn't pay me to drink or eat. And I, I can imagine some people out of the depths of their horror saying, how in the world could all of that have happened accidentally? Right, because but, it didn't, right? Because it, it didn't, is it the didn't. point. Isn't they were put right. in on purpose to increase profits. That's exactly right. And, and, and marching with this is the rise of industrial chemistry. So you see mm -hmm. food manufacturers really taking advantage of all of these new things. There are aniline coltar dyes come of age here. Artificial sweeteners like saccharin come of age. And, and food manufacturers, saccharin is a lot cheaper than sugar. So they would just substitute it. Um, but they didn't have to label it, so you right. might think you were getting yeah. something made with sugar, but you weren't. Uh, preservatives, and the preservatives were crazy, right? There was formaldehyde, yeah. which went into milk. But, but wait, didn't formaldehyde keep the milk fresh longer? Actually, <laughs> you know, that you can, yes, <laughs> sort of. Right? I always think of it as kind of zombie milk, but you could put formaldehyde into milk, and, and it did two things. It stopped decay. I mean, it's an embalming material, right? Yeah. It was used to embalm courses. So it stopped decay or slowed down decay. They, there were actually advertisements that were sent to American dairy saying, use our formaldehyde compound, which was always had some innocuous name, right? Preservaline, <laughs> Rosaline, <laughs> Preservaline. <laughs> right? And the milk, you can put it on the counter and it'll just stay immaculate for 10 days and i'm reading that and i'm going ew right <laughs> if i <laughs> it's nice no longer any relationship to actual milk right yep. uh, okay. so they use that they use the cleaning product borax in butter and in meat they also use formaldehyde in meat they use salicylic acid which we know is a fever reducer in american wine and beer in particular it was a, a 
prevented fermentation, right? And really good for bleeding ulcers and things too. Yeah, that's and you <laughs> could get an, exactly, and you could get an enormously high dose of this. If you had several glasses of wine a day, mm -hmm. they later calculated you were like having more than a medicinal dose of salicylic acid. Yeah. So uh, without being without knowing that, right? So it yeah. was I, when you look back at it, it's just like whoa, how did anyone ever stay upright in this time period? And yeah. There's a lot yeah. of description, I will tell you. They didn't have any public health tracking, so you know people weren't all entirely connecting the dot. But I just heard a historian uh, describe the 19th century as the century of the great American stomach ache yeah. because <laughs> so many people had gastrointestinal problems, and, and, and some of that is going to be this. But right? you also... Wow. Uh, said, and maybe stretching a point a little bit, something like uh, 10,000 children under the age of two died every year in New York City, many for causes that were exacerbated by bad milk. That's exactly right. And in the 1850s, even, uh, mil physicians were describing milk as milk poison. And you yeah. get these really gruesome description of, of, of just the terrible health of the children that survive, right? And right. Uh, all of the different ways that they're sick. And it was so bad that even it was taken up by investigative journalists, right, who uh, published reports on the horrible quality of the milk supply. The, some of the national magazines started looking at the milk supply. And even into the early 20th century, you see people, the, the milk, the the risks of milk, both uh, the lack of pasteurization and the germs and the dirt, because dirt, yeah. dairies were dirty, yeah. right? No yeah. one really practiced any decent hygiene. And I had one yeah. case that I yeah. think I wrote about from Indiana where a family brings in their bottle of milk because it's wriggling at the bottom and the mm -hmm. dairy man had cut it with pond water, which in included horsehair worms. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so that you see cookbook writers actually writing sections in their cookbooks, right? Mm -hmm. Warning cooks, don't, you know, be very careful if you're going to give milk to sick people, for instance, because milk is so dangerous and, you, and, and giving home sterilization techniques even. You know, and how, like to, how, to, do how to spot things, the entire book of how to spot food adulterations for the home cook. Um, but what our target here, one of our, our central points is this Pure Food and Drug Act from mm -hmm. 1910 or 11. Uh, um, it was passed in 1906 was the six. U.S. Food and Drug Act. And yeah. so maybe you can give us then a thumbnail sketch of how Harvey Wiley enters the picture through his first, I really love the story of the first time he did this report on sugar and sweeteners and then how that led to more and more and more because uh, he's even though it's not a biography, it's very biographical because he's such a central figure. No, that that's, fair? yeah, that is exactly right. He's sort of the, <clears throat> the main character or the hero at the heart of the story of how we eventually did get inadequate regulation, but regulation, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. Wiley was a chemist. He was a farm boy from Indiana with a deep love of science, right? And he got an MD in Indiana and a chemistry degree in Harvard and was the first chemistry pro professor at Purdue when it was a tiny little school with a faculty of six. He was <laughs> all of chemistry <laughs> at Purdue yes. at that time. But he was very interested, got very interested in fake food. I, I mean, I think in part he had a very missionary zeal about science, science in the service of good. And mm -hmm. that led him to really look at these issues of fraudulent products. And he did that in Indiana to, you know, such an impressive degree that he was recruited to join the federal government. And in 1883, he became chief chemist. This leads me to these reports we're talking about of the Bureau of Chemistry. And so we have no FDA, right? There's no consumer protection agency. There's no cons consumer protection laws. And the USDA is the only federal agency at all that has any, uh, you know, jurisdiction over food or food safety, which it is pretty much not done up until that point, right? I mean, it was yeah. very 
very focused on helping farmers. And, you know, if the food was bad, well, too bad. Uh, but he came in and he said, I want to make this one of the missions of the department. I mm -hmm. think that we stand for a safe food supply here. And so he started assigning his chemists to do investigations of the food supply. Starting in 1883, they produced this series of bulletins of which I think I am one of the few people standing today who has read them all, mm -hmm. right? But these <laughs> they sound fascinating. They are so interesting. And, 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 you know, they're written in this wonderful Victorian language that's com yeah. occasionally completely irate about what they find. So they're also kind of fun to read. But they look at everything. They started with dairy and they look at, uh, you know, meats and they look at canned vegetables and they look at sugars and they look at spices and cocoa and coffee and wine and beer. And they're really going through the food supply. Um, and they start issuing these reports. And these reports are really a series of experts exposés, very alarming to business because no one had been paying any attention to this. Mm -hmm. um, and he just keeps putting these out to the point that I think he realizes, and you start seeing these bulletins themselves change. There's always a, a letter at the beginning to the Secretary of Agriculture, I am proud mm -hmm. to present to you right mm -hmm. this research. And the first one is pretty neutral. I'm proud to present to you this report on dairy, um, which flags a few problems. And by the end of them, they're like table thumping. Yeah. We need to fix, I'm thumping. <laughs> we need to fix this. <laughs> Right now, we need regulation. If we can't have regulation, please give us labels so people know what is going into the food supply. So you can almost look at these and see him change, right? Mm -hmm. In which he is really increasingly convinced by his own research that this is a huge unresolved problem that's putting people's health at risk. And he's right. So we're we're safe in saying he's, it, it appears that he became a, a data-driven uh advocate, basically. Yeah, he, actually he started won. out believing in chemistry for the good of humanity, which Joanne and I love as a yes. big quotation. Uh, he believes it can do good, and then he finds out how awful things is, and it just, it makes him obsessed with this idea that something has to be done. That's exactly right. And he was obsessed. There was a point after uh, he did the first of these poison squad tests, which came in the early 20th, uh, where he said to Congress, I was converted by my research. Yeah. I, when I started doing this, I did not think the things were as bad and as dangerous as they turned out to be. So he started out, it was the weight of the evidence that eventually drove him to say, I can't just step by, stand by and let nothing happen. Yeah. And that's a double-edged sword too, right? Because yeah. you start out as this, you know, it's research or nothing. And then you become an advocate mm -hmm. driven by the weight of the research. And then you're perceived as an advocate, think, right? Yeah, and and, and you see that too. Political ramifications and all that. So that's to exactly. And to, were, to Joanne, who will get the floor in a minute. But when you were writing, it is... <laughs> I think when I'm reading, it was impossible not to see this as maybe even a thinly veiled parable for today yep. between the things, the shenanigans that are going on, the political reactions, the food crusader over here, the companies that are, you know, lobbying intensively to say, don't you dare do this to this to us at the same time that they and their senatorial partisans are saying, this is all about freedom of choice for mankind. Are you gonna let the government tell you what to do? It's like, I'm sure you had contemporary situations in mind too, didn't you confess? Increasingly, I mean, when I, I like narrative science history and uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is my fourth and, and there's always this moment where you can rejoice in the fact that your story is never going to be out of date because it happened a hundred years ago. You know, that's what happened then. Yeah. And so I usually start thinking, I'm going to tell this fascinating, mm -hmm. <coughs> sorry, I've got a travel cough. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell this fascinating forgotten history, right? This, that we've forgotten this and, and it's, and, uh, and it's really, we cannot understand who we are today unless we know how we yeah. got here. And I yeah. always start there. This one, more, I think, than any of the ones that I did, as I was 
unfolding the story, I, I started seeing the connections to the day, yeah. the, um, the, the hyper cozy relationship between business and government mm -hmm. um, that both prevents regulation and then frankly corrupts regulation. And, and there's some incredible examples of that in, in even in the 1906 law, this handholding mm -hmm. between big, what I'm going to call big government, big government and big business. Yeah. In, in yeah. which, you know, they see themselves as allied and separate from the rest of us who are not, mm -hmm. you know, big buzz, big business. And so regulations get compromised and things are less safe than they could be if we t approached it mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. And I did by the time I was really getting into that start saying this is today. I mean, that we are still fighting this exact fight today mm -hmm. and we're not always winning even as they didn't always win then. So you you followed a trajectory similar to Wiley's, it sounds like, of starting your research and you're going to do this and write journalism. And now you've got, people are going to say, this isn't journalism, this is advocacy. And the question is, how could it not be advocacy That's once you've exactly done what you've right. done to journalism? And I realized I want it to be advocacy in the way that, in the same way, I have this body of evidence that says, cautionary tale here. Yeah. Let's, let's not make the mistakes of the past. And yeah. I want to remind people of some of these mistakes because mm -hmm. I think that matters, right? There's no point in, in doing a story like this. And then, so here I am, Harvey Wiley. Pretty soon I'll be, you know, picketing the White House <laughs> or something. There you go. But, uh, but I do, I actually was in, I was at a book festival in Michigan this weekend. Uh, and they, and people said, kept saying to me, well, you know, so what do you, how has it changed what you do? And I said, uh, I, I think I've become an advocate for better labels. I can see yeah. all these business government compromises in the way we label food. And mm -hmm. on the one hand, everyone says, was, oh, well, you just need to be an informed consumer, right? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is unfair anyway, because none of, no one can keep up with everything. But on the other hand, we're not actually going to be honest on the labels. So good yeah. luck to you trying to be informed. And I do want to thump the desk about that. Right? Yeah. I need a Harvey Wiley top hat and off I'll go. <laughs> well, and that was a key thing of his is in addition to poisons and things which can, you know, that were people were adulterating with, companies were adulterating with, which sounds scurrilous and hyperbolic and things, but was true. There's also his fact that he says central to all of this, why can't we be truthful about what the consumers are getting so that they know what's in there? Yes. Uh, as a central point, it's deceiving the consumer is That's not exactly good. That's exactly right. And one of the things he said about that that I think is wholly true today is he said, and you're making an assumption that everyone who's consuming this food and drink is healthy and can tolerate mm -hmm. whatever these bad things are. But we have children. These doses could be really dangerous for small children. We have elderly people. We have sick people. What about them? Mm -hmm. And as we have these additive doses that we're not even fully revealing, what what are we feeding these people whose health might be parallel, parallel, you know, in peril? And, and so he, that was always one of the things he tried to say. And the other thing, and this I think is also true today, is he would make the point and that some of the worst of this food and, can, you know, chemically altered food, adulterated food, inexpensive extended food uh, is sold to the poor. Mm -hmm. So that if you have a lot of money, you know, you can avoid mm -hmm. some of the worst of this, right? You can have your, uh, your your housekeeper go out and troll the farmer's market for only the best and cook you home fresh, home, you know, wonderful fresh meals. But if you don't function at one of yeah. those income levels, th then you really are getting the very worst of this. And so there is also that kind of social justice issue mm -hmm. that was true then and is true now. Yeah. You know, I was... Uh, thinking when, when I was reading the book, I, I could see uh, the role of women popping up a lot, like mm. housewives saying, yeah, I want good food for my family. And women's magazines saying, yeah, we should write about this. And then even how Wiley began to write at Good Housekeeping and, and it uh, paralleled with the suffragette movement. Mm. And I was just so impressed with this and that, you know, it there's the consumers are saying, when they start discovering there's all these things, they're like, wait a minute, yeah. you know? And, and as Jeff pointed out, cookbooks being written to say, yeah, this is how you avoid this. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I was really, and the role of women, I think, is so important in this story. And it's especially interesting because, of course, uh, women don't have the national vote at that time, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, 19th Amendment didn't pass for another 20 years, right? Almost 20 years after early 20s. I think it was 1920, 1921, when women got the right to vote. It was right. So all of these women have no voting power, and yet they band together in wonderful ways to flex their political muscle. And I mean, one of the things that the women's group did, like the Federated Women's Clubs, right, is they persuaded Wiley's group to write a buyer beware here for safe food guide uh, for housewives across America. Here's how you can test to see if there's stone in your tea, formaldehyde in your milk, mm -hmm. right? Here's how you precipitate out this. Um, it's actually fascinating to read that because uh, you know, they have all these, they want to turn the housewife into a chemist mm -hmm. and, and they basically say, and when you're handling sulfuric acid, between, be sure not to get a severe acid burn. <laughs> and I was reading you going, uh, -huh. but <laughs> you know, there, but this is one of the other things that they do. They're saying there's not kind of equal educational opportunities for women that there are for men either. And so our job is in part to make sure that women are educated. And so you see cookbook writers doing this. The cooking schools taught principles of science and principles of bacteriology, mm -hmm. right? They would take these young women who couldn't get into a science class, right? They weren't welcome at the universities. And they would teach them the principles of Louis Pasteur. And if you read uh, the early cookbooks like Fanny Farmer's famous Boston Cooking School mm -hmm. book, she walks through the chemical elements that make up foods and why they're important. I mean, you really see women banding together and, and, and actually beginning to have some political power in this sense. And Wiley, literally, when he was running his crusade, uh, deliberately reached out to women's groups, right? And mm -hmm. It recognized that they were going to help him change this, which they did. And when he organized, there's this one moment in the book, and then I'll, where he organizes very strategically a meeting of food of good food advocates to meet with President Roosevelt, um, and he doesn't go. Roosevelt is not a major fan of his, and he knows that. <laughs> um, but uh, he it includes women, right, from these different women's groups because he recognizes that they have this political force. And I guess I looked back and thought, I'm so proud of all of those women, right, who just – you know, stood their ground and said, you know, but we are going to change this. We are going to push for better and we're going to teach each other if no one else will teach us. And they did that. Yeah. <laughs> Very impressive. And then, as I said, ultimately, and this is getting towards, you know, uh, we, we can go back to his outing from the government. Right. But, um, but uh, after this happens and he gets a position with good housekeeping and they're like, absolutely, we want you here writing for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's interesting, and and, also, and and he gets he gets his bride now, who um, was a suffragette. Yeah, don't you like, love that? He yeah, married yes. a suffragette, yeah. and, and just, she gets arrested protesting service. Woodrow Wilson, <laughs> and he says <laughs> goes to jail. And he's like, well, uh, yeah, I'm an advocate, so if this is what it takes for her to advocate, then yeah. Yeah, yeah. And with all his male friends going, how could you let the little woman go to jail? And he's right. I mean, yeah, it was yeah, so cool. But yeah. you've picked up on something else there, Joanne, and that is women's magazines in the same period where, you know, access to women is not easy. Women's, women's magazines like Good Housekeeping and Ladies Home Journal were real pioneers and leaders in investigative yeah. reporting yeah. and in information. And in fact, Ladies Home Journal published some of the first exposés of patent medicines and how you know, completely deceptive they were and how dangerous they were. They they hired investigative reporters of the time are called muckrakers. Yeah. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt coined that term, not in a friendly, admiring way. He was very angry about investigative journalists exposing corruption in government. And he called the men with, you know, raking muck at the bottom of the pond, never reporting on anything good. And, um, but it stuck. And, uh, but, but Ladies Home Journal just hired these guys. They did these phenomenal exposés of drugs and food. And good how Housekeeping, when Wiley was there, he created their test laboratories. Mm -hmm. He 
good something that if you follow good housekeeping even today there's the good housekeeping seal of approval yeah. right. and he used that to the point that they would run tests on food and drink and, and cosmetics advertised in the magazine and if they didn't pass whatever the Wiley test was. I'd love to go into those good housekeeping archives. Uh, he would censor their ads. They couldn't advertise in the magazine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they had to pass this, this is good for you test before he would allow it in. And then he wrote columns, you know, advocating for nutrition and unble unbreached bread and and better food laws. I mean, you know, he really used it as a platform. There's, a, there's an interesting little uh, resonance with today. And wasn't it Teen Vogue, who in the past year mm -hmm. got so much notice for investigative journalism, and it sounds so much like what we came to expect in the early 20th century from good housekeeping. That's exactly right. And Teen Vogue, I because I remember, uh, you know, sharing this on Twitter, did some of the best political reporting and Me Too reporting. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. like wow. Um, they they've done some really sharp stuff, and, and it does also. I mean, I'm a journalist, so I, I think it's really important, and I say everyone, investigative journalism justifies the First Amendment, because mm -hmm. that's where you really see journalism as a watchdog, you know, as an, which is an essential function of any healthy democracy. And so here, at this period where there was no regulation at all until we really started regulating both business, Roosevelt's, you know, trust busting, mm -hmm regulations. The Food and Drug Act was the first consumer protection law ever passed by the United States. So you're laying down these foundations and a lot of it is in response to scandals and, and a lot of these scandals. Uh, we, re we often regulate in response to a scandal, right? But a lot mm -hmm. of these scandals are revealed by uh, journalists who are exposing mm -hmm. the evils of the railroad or the food industry or uh, Lincoln Stephens, corruption in government, yeah. the shame of the city, or Ida Tarbell, right? And, Speaking and of a great no female. It's no coincidence that, that The Jungle was published. It took a little while, but it yeah. played its part. And coincidentally or not, happened at the same time as all this discussion about the Pure Food and Drug Act. I love the story of the jungle because, I mean, and it was an Great education chapter. to me. I'm yeah, it's one of my, it. isn't it fun? It's just, it was so fun to read. And I mean, yeah. I'm a journalist, so I we all had to study the jungle uh, <laughs> in journalism schools, right? And I mean, when I actually started looking at it, I was going, whoa, I didn't know that. I mean, I didn't realize this full backstory mm. of, and what a tough fact. time! What a tough time it had just getting air. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was first. I mean, he was. Um, I always, I think this is, but you know, Sinclair Lewis, Upton Sinclair. I always confuse yeah. those guys, and this is Upton Sinclair. And now yeah, I yeah. get to do it for you guys. But Upton Sinclair <laughs> was a struggling writer and a socialist, partly because he was so poor, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, but he also hung out with a lot of muckraking journalists in New York, like Stephens. Ray Stannard Baker, who investigated the railroads, and uh, he got it. He uh, first wrote about he first wrote that novel for a socialist newspaper in Kansas, which I just love yeah. this so much. Which was a hotbed of socialism, right? Well, so also uh, one of the <laughs> two hot Chicago and Kansas City were the place for meat processing too. I'm from Kansas That's City. That's exactly right, and I know so where the he, stockyards were. He had read about and become very interested in a butcher strike in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a piece for that for Appeal to Reason, the Kansas Socialist newspaper. And then he said, I'd really like to write a novel about the plight of the worker, right, in, in the Chicago meat yards. And, uh, the, and the editor knew him. He, he had actually read some Civil War novel. And so he commissioned him to write a serialized novel called The Jungle, right? Mm -hmm. And so in 1905, the only place that book was published was in this, you know, small socialist newspaper out of Kansas. He had a publisher, Macmillan, uh, to turn it into a, you know, a big book and they canceled it when they started reading <laughs> it because I've always thought to myself, man, that editor cost them a lot of money. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> the editor just didn't believe it and he was so horrified and he finally wrote to Upton Sinclair and he said, this is so disgusting. We're just not going to publish it. Yeah. And <laughs> That's kind of the point. Up, yeah. Having to take his manuscript door to door to publishers in New York. 
and he finally got this publisher. It's the forerunner of Double Day Today, Double Day Page, yeah. and uh, they he wrote it and turned it in, and then they didn't believe it, right? They didn't believe these grisly descriptions, even though he had spent months in the Chicago stockyards, and they sent investigators out to Chicago who came back and said, yeah, it's probably even worse than he says. Yeah. And then they send it to Teddy Roosevelt, who doesn't believe it, right? You see this chain of yeah. disbelief. He sends investigators out to Chicago. They come back and say it's even worse than in the book. <laughs> and so I think what people, even though this is a novel, right? Yeah. And a very preachy novel, right? <laughs> because he was a socialist. It's the power of the real in it that really made it such an explosive thing. Everyone looked at it mm -hmm. and they said, really i'm eating these disgusting things and the european market started canceling their contract yeah. with american meat growers yeah. and so that pushed forward the meat inspection act of 1906 mm -hmm. and in this tidal wave of outrage which had followed you know some of wiley's poison squad experiments and other exposés and then this sort of absolute shout out of a best selling novel the food and drug act finally passed the same in the same month both of them passed in june 1906 then there's the problem of enforcement but joanne yes. back to you <laughs> <laughs> so true yeah <laughs> You know, I, I was thinking, of course, in the middle of all these things that are passing, what happened before they pass are some lawyers and some representatives from the businesses, you know, trying to sort of, you know, say, oh, no, we can't have that. Or um, mm -hmm. uh, my favorite was, oh, but this amount is just fine, right? But they forget that maybe someone will then drink 24 cans of Coke or bottles of Coke mm -hmm. back then. You know, right. or or they will also be eating these other things, which also have those, you know, the sodium benzoate or salicylic acid or saccharin, you know, yes. and just the sort of this lawsuits and arguing just, you know, sort of clouding <laughs> the, the real picture of what's happening, you know, practically and in reality with the consumers. And that was... Uh part of the strategy of business at the time, mm -hmm. right? When Wiley first started doing his, you know, little reports in the 1880s, they were like, oh yeah, sure, Bureau of Chemistry, whatever. And then yeah. they started to build up some momentums. And by the 1890s, you really see American industries organizing to push back against regulation. Nobody, they are living in this glorious period of unfettered, do what you want. And mm -hmm. they don't want that to end. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you see all kinds of different things happen in the 90s. Um, you know, the deliberate trashing of Wiley's reputation, smears on the research, um, uh, fake, speaking of the modern day fake news, uh, the, the borax manufacturers yeah. hired a publicist who would write stories, fraud, fraudulent stories under a false name and, and yeah. publish them in newspapers around the country, suggesting that preservative free food had killed people when actually when it was investigated some of them were just suicides but right so they mm -hmm. did all of this um, and then they went to uh, presidents and department heads and said you know did their very best behind the scenes to both damage Wiley's standing but to fend off the regulation and that was very effective until this sort of period of major scandals drove everything forward. Um, and they put a lot of money into it. So then, by, I mean, a lot of money. Uh -huh. So that this treason of the Senate book that sparked Roosevelt's uh, comment about muckrakes was just, it was just story after story of senators who've been bought off by industry, including the food industry, right? There's huge amount of payments to government to make sure that this didn't happen. And it really worked. Then there was this 1908 conference I made a note of where one of the guests was, is it A.J. Hines? Yes, I Mr. love yes. this story. Mr. Hines himself who said, Yay, no, you? actually we have now years of experience <laughs> without using preservatives in our products. And it was uncommonly successful with very little spoilage. How irritating that would have been. 
I love the Henry J. Hines story, and I yes, have this kind of it. fangirl feeling about him that I never <laughs> had too. before. You relate that well very well in the book, because that's how yeah. I felt as I was reading it. I'm like, go, oh, Hines. Because yeah. he, was, he was basically the first big person to discover that he could leave out the preservatives and use it as a marketing tool. That's exactly, he was a brilliant marketer. It was one yeah. of the, you know, Heinz 57 varieties and all. It was one of the secrets of his success. But yeah, he basically told the manufacturer of his plant who was like, sort of was, you're kidding me. We're going to take preservatives out of our products. Start yeah. working on that now. And then to do that, he had to reinvent ketchup, which had mm -hmm. been this thin, watery, nasty, you know, sauce that contained a lot of vegetable refuse and dyes and things and make a thick tomato sauce, right, which had enough natural acid from the tomato, basically, that it was, you know, presented, prevented spoilage and it worked. So he yeah. gave us modern ketchup. And then he, but it wasn't just that he did this with his products, which I thought was cool, but you know, he actively supported the Food and Drug mm -hmm. Act. He sent mm -hmm. people to talk to Roosevelt. He had his people and he himself gave public presentations. And I always imagine him because he was very rich, right? He lived in one of those Pittsburgh neighborhoods with Carnegie and Westinghouse yeah. and they were furious at him, right? Like all his dinner party invitations went away as he starts <laughs> doing this and he just just keeps doing it. And the other thing about him, it, he ran a model factory. He had doctors and nurses and a uh, swimming pool for his employees. And he would give them special holiday uh, excursions and hire different things for them and manicurists for the f women who worked wow. there. I mean, he was a really interesting guy, right? Nobody would believe it if he were a character in a novel. <laughs> no, that's exactly I right. Know, but he's real life. <laughs> I think yeah. the, I mean, you know, if I was the Heinz company, I'd be like doing retro advertising, our origins, you know, our, our yeah. great origins, right? Yeah. But no, he really did make a difference. And, and he, the other thing he did, though, is he was perfectly prepared to play dirty the way everyone did. So as people started attacking Wiley and some of the uh, regulations, he had his publicist, you know, plant stories about mm -hmm. how bad they were and what bad. So you really see this sort of behind the scenes warfare um, between different businesses and between government and business. And, and after the food law passed, of course, business uh, is very effective uh, in, in saying, okay, this, we were forced to have this law. We got, we were able to water the law down a great deal before it passed, which they mm -hmm. did, right? There had been an initial part of that law, for instance, that set very precise safety standards for different compounds. Yeah. Uh, and that was taken out by Congress at yeah. the request of business because they didn't want those, right? Yep. And yep. and there were other, and they defunded it, right? They were very good at saying, okay, well, we've got this law. We see this today all the time. Sure. Yes, there's this regulation, but it's not going to do us any harm if no money goes into it. So the Food Modernization yep. Safety Act that passed under Obama, I mean, speaking of being defunded, right? Recent. <laughs> yes. If I could, okay, since we're on that topic of the, the Pure Food and Drug Act, um, yeah. I, I really enjoyed this exchange because it sounds so modern that you, um, where you quoted uh, Nelson Aldrich, Senator, and what's his name, McCumber. So Aldrich says, are we to take up the question as to what a man shall eat and what a man shall drink and put him under severe penalties if he is eating or drinking something different from what the chemists of the agricultural department think desirable? And McCumber answers, on the contrary, it is the purpose of the bill that a man may determine for himself what he will eat and what he will not eat. It is the purpose of the bill that he may go into the market and when he pays for what he asks for, that he shall get it and not get some poisonous substance in lieu of that. Oh Don't goodness. you love that? Yes. <laughs> and you do that so well. I should take there you out on book oh, tour. Thank you. Thank I was going to say, yeah. Right how modern does this, how modern does this sound? <laughs> it's all, you know, the freedom and it's like, the, the, you know, the liberals are trying to stomp on the freedom of the American public and everything. It's like, yes, but they don't know what they're buying. That's what you're talking about, freedom. 
That's exactly right. And there's a, a chemist, uh, a New York chemist, Jesse Battershall, who I uh, quoted mm -hmm. some of his book that he wrote in the 1880s, in which he actually talks about this characteristic of American society in which, you know, we're hyper vigilant about the rights of the individual, <laughs> not realizing that if we don't take some social action, we actually damage the individual, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and he's talking about the fact, which was true in the 19th, that you know, different countries in Europe are putting in these protections. Canada has them, but we don't do it because we're fly, flying the flag of individual rights in a way that gets yeah. in between our ability to just take care of each other. The other thing about that McCumber exchange that I love so much, it, it actually is, is not so different from what I was saying about Kansas, but when you look at this period of time, you know, here's Aldrich, he's from the Northeast, privileged mm -hmm. Northeastern, right? And here's McCumber, who's from a Western state and, and what is today a red state. So a lot of these states like the Dakotas and Indiana and Texas, they were really progressive, right? And, and they were real standard bearers in this fight. And they weren't so cozy with big industry because they didn't have any. Right. They were yeah. largely rural agricultural states. And so they were really standing up for small farmers and small businessmen in a way that the Easterners who, you know, were living in neighborhoods with Vanderbilt and whatever were much. And so you see a very different thing than what you see now where the Northeast kind of shades liberal and a lot of those yeah. states stayed, stayed far more conservative. Being, so, being the yeah. liberal that I am, I would like to think that once people see that something is wrong, they won't do it anymore. And so I was horrified once we had established the, the uh, it had been established that saccharin is a dangerous drug. Along yes. comes the lawyer from the perpetual evil giant Monsanto, who yes. says, well, okay, you can pass this law banning saccharin, but wait three years, please. We have this supply we have to use up. And the government goes, okay, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You want that Monsanto? I was so, I had actually not realized the saccharin origins of Monsanto until yeah. I did this research. And I was just like, wow, I get to put Monsanto into my <laughs> Story of you know early 20th century evil business doing, and of course then Monsanto also shows up in the Coke trial yeah. because uh, Wiley sues Coca Cola shortly before he's forced, really forced out of government, and uh, in, this is in 1911, uh, and, and part of it is caffeine, right? Yep. By back then, a glass of Coke was about like a glass of Red Bull today or a can mm. of Red Bull today, so it was super loaded with caffeine, and Monsanto is also the caffeine supplier. So you see them dancing through this period. And they did a really good job of beating back any and all yeah. efforts to yes. re regulate background well. 60 years later, I'm in high school. This is the 70s. And people still find saccharin controversial. But maybe we should continue to use it. Right. <laughs> It, yeah, okay. and you yeah. know, then later it pops as a suspected carcinogen. I mean, the argument back then was, and you know, you can't sneak artificial sweetener, which has no nutritive value, into food without at least letting consumers know yeah. that it's there. Yeah. And so we really have to treat it like a potentially risky additive. And of course, Monsanto didn't want them to do that and was very successful in years of litigation, right, mm -hmm. fighting that off. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola did eventually have to take a fair amount of caffeine out of their Cokes. They're well, probably putting it back in now in the Red yeah. Bull area. After but I, back what, then a semi-successful argument that caffeine was not an additive because it was part of their formula. Right. Right. And they eventually lost that at the Supreme Court level, right. but, but it, it took a while. Right? It took a lot of money that they it earned. It took a lot of, a lot of taxpayer happened. money, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, the, I mean, those early battles, the battle over bleached flour, I, I don't yeah. like bleach, bleached flour because I can generally taste the bleach in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I just use unbleached flour, but it was really interesting to me that they were saying, you know, this, this process leaves residues that we don't like in flour. Why don't we just take it out in a proactive way? And then you have the American millers and flour manufacturers, you know, you can't tell us what to do and we're going to take this to Supreme Court. And they did yes. and they won. Because nitrates are a, pro a natural par product of the process. So right. they're not an so additive. It's, okay. it's not an additive, right? Right. Yes, 
that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, the way you can argue things. So actually, before our time completely gets away, uh -oh. <laughs> one thing we like to talk about here at Read Science is communicating science to the general public. And I love, there's a, a statement here in the book um, that Wiley had said that I would like to read. And then you can comment further, Deborah, because you, of course, are this incredible advocate for you know good science knowledge getting out to the general public and including we'll also talk about your magazine on dark for a minute or two if you like sure. so um so back towards the end of the book um we've got uh wiley um he had uh written uh, he'd written so many things um but um we have um well, what is it? It, re it, re it? it reflected, and I can't remember what it is. It reflected his old passion to do good and his abiding belief in the power of science to benefit society. The freedom of science should be kept inviolate, he urged in its conclusion, and he re returned to his old call for moral standards and research that science should lift up to its ultimate calling, which was to search for truth and thereby to elevate and improve mankind. Yeah. And that was his autobiography. That's what I thought. I was thinking. Yeah. Must yeah. Be. I love that. I mean, that was why I put it in there. I read it and I thought, that is so true, right? Science in the service of good and science in, uh, in its ability to do independent inquiry. And, and mm -hmm. often when I'm talking, I do a lot of talking to the public. I hugely believe that uh, one of the most important things we do is make people comfortable with science in their everyday life, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a cosmology writer. I'm really interested in sort of the science of what's in your kitchen, I, you know, to put yeah. it one way. But, but I feel very strongly that science, I mean, so understanding science and what it tells us about the world makes the world a much more fascinating place. And we don't want to deprive people of that. Everyone should be able to walk through that door and see this fantastic, complicated, wonderful realization about of how life on earth works and and all the just really incredible ingenious ways that you know it it, it thrives and turns around us um and, and i love being able to do that and I, I think it's important for people like me i'm a science journalist and so that is when i get missionary i will say that right uh in the same way like with this book in poisoner's handbook i'll say when i'm talking to people i'll say we live in a chemical world right mm -hmm. it, uh, but we're often afraid to navigate it. And mm -hmm. so let me tell you these things because science is in fact, it will map the world for you and help you make common, even just common sense decisions about how you navigate. And, and that should not be, uh, you know, the knowledge of a small select mm -hmm. group huddled around some science campfire. Everyone mm -hmm. should have that knowledge and we should all want to do that. So I want to do that, but I, I really like to encourage scientists to do that too. Let's share this, right? This should be everyone's common knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. and a science literate civilization is a better civilization. And, and, and Wiley completely got that. He got, you know, first that in advocacy you needed public support, but and but you in the 1890s he hired a science writer, right? Mm -hmm. He was doing yeah. these geeky wonky reports about the state of food that were going to a bunch of other policy and scientists and wonks like him. And he was, I want uh, the American public to know this. Mm -hmm. And he hired this guy. He was kind of an advocate, Alexander Wedderburn. And his whole job was to do public reports and engage right. the public and make sure people knew that. So he was a very early record. He had very early recognition of how important that is. And I really love that part of his story. Mm -hmm. And I like what, it's the same thing you guys do. Let's get this information out, this, let's share it. Let's make it people friendly, right? Mm -hmm. Not just mm -hmm. science friendly, but people friendly. So that yeah. everyone that can make s'mores. People, right? Yeah. 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 We, we can all sing around the campfire or something. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Deborah, why don't you uh, tell uh, tell the audience a little bit about your magazine, Undark? Because it's relatively new, maybe two years. Yeah, it's just going on uh, its third year, I think. Third. So, okay. 
Um, so when I came to, I came to MIT in the summer of 2015, and I was thinking about my my program, night science journalism program, and, and what we could do to foster good science journalism, and 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 as its corollary, public understanding of science. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, it's one thing to educate 10 smart journalists a year, which is what we do. We're a fellowship mm -hmm. program, but why? don't we try to provide a home mm -hmm. within the reason, within our budget, basically. Why don't we try to provide a home for good science journalism and good science storytelling? And uh, this is really our mission, you know, science that kind of hovers in that science society intersection, the push and pull between science and society. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I hired on a part-time basis uh, the editor who's now the editor of the magazine, Tom Zeller from the New York Times, who was a longtime environment writer. And we just sat down and brainstormed for six months. What would what do we want this to be? We came up with the name Undark out of my previous book, Poisoner's Handbook, because oh. Undark was the trade name for radium based luminous paint in the nineteen twenties, yes. right? Yes, and we I loved that, that kind of <laughs> light and shadow illumination of science idea. Um, and then we've been, I mean, if ever a product has been invented as you go, it would be Undark, but, um, <laughs> but we've really stuck to that core mission. We're going to provide a home for good science journalism that allows us to support the whole community of science journalism. And we're going to do these really in-depth stories that have meaning right and we have and we have journalists who write for us probably our hottest story recently was written by a doctor who um, in, in California who was uh, looking at a case where of, of the way that medical institutions don't talk to each other and, the, and what that means for mm -hmm. uh, patients and the fragmentation of medical records and that one mm -hmm. you know has just gotten tens and tens of thousands of views and pick up we're a steal our stuff magazine. That's something else we developed. So if you go to Undark, you know, there's a republish button. Anyone can republish yeah. our stuff for free. And then there's a list of all the people we do this with regularly, like the Atlantic. So when we started, you know, we had, if we were lucky, 30,000 page views a month. And now mm -hmm. we're running 10 to 20 times that a month. So uh, that that's good too because the other part of that is always can I drive a conversation, mm -hmm. right? I want to can I drive a conversation about this issue? Can I make people care? Can I illuminate this corner that you haven't considered? Mm -hmm. Can I you know make a difference in an area that matters? We're doing a seven part series on particulate pollution right now, and um, that which has been a job right picking the seventh worst places in the world for yeah. particulate pollution. Say, yeah, we're right. going to Beijing, Delhi. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Macedonia. Um, I can't remember them all. Chile, I think. And of course, in the United States, the San Joaquin Valley of California. Mm -hmm. right. um, and, and But, you know, why do we do that? It's not just to provide a home for good journalism. It's partly to illuminate this issue. And, and if you could, it's to drive a conversation to the point that people are saying, we have to do something about this, which makes me sound just like Harvey Washington Wiley, right? <laughs> exactly. I'm going to, so, it's it important. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're right near the end of the, the hour. And I was wondering if there was anything else uh, maybe we forgot to ask you that you would like to add. Uh, we... Yeah, I mean, this has been a great conversation. I, I'll, I'll, one of the things yeah. I've thought about, and I realized this with the, uh, uh, the Poison Squad book is that I'm really attracted to stories of scientists who can draw, who can change the conversation, mm -hmm. who can drive a paradigm shift of a, a tiny one or a large one. So, you know, Love at Goom Park was Harry Harlow and, and the idea that love matters and the mm -hmm. shifting landscape of psychology that recognizes that and, mm -hmm. and, Poisoner's Handbook was about two scientists building the modern forensic age and the way we catch killers and you know figure out how to detect exposures at very small levels. And of course, Wiley is you know the story of the invention of food safety and you know the way we think about food and what makes it safe and how we protect the food supply and each other. Mm -hmm. and, and they all remind me that a single person 
I mean, sometimes an obsessive, difficult person, (laughs) but that a single person can actually make a difference. And I think at a time, bringing it back to today, where I think um, we often feel really overwhelmed by what's going on in our own country. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. It's important to remember that, right, that you know, really can yeah. hold up your candle and we try sure, to make a difference. Sure and I think met, that's that matters to me, yeah. too. Sorry, but we sure have met a lot of those people in in the guise of the books that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. And it's it's always a pleasure. And it, it, you're right. It's a hopeful thing. It it shows us. Uh, some life lessons that are really valuable. That's right. So, you know, when people read my book, I don't want them just to be queasy. I <laughs> yeah. would like them yeah. to leave with a message of I can make a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I had taken some notes as I was first reading your book, and I was thinking just about how, what kind of face workout I was getting. <laughs> you know, knit, knitted eyebrows, surprised eyebrow, right? Grimace, right. and, you know, like... I'm <laughs> just like, okay, if anyone was watching me read, <laughs> this is what you're but, but the book does go past that. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, Deborah, thank you so much for coming on. I, like I said, I was so excited that this day has finally arrived, that we could be graced by your presence and uh, talk about your wonderful book and other books and other things. So, um, for those of you just need a reminder or just joining. Um, so the two books I have, and maybe I should get the other ones. So uh, of Deborah's are The Poisoner's Handbook uh, from 2010, and then took another eight years to get The Poison Squad. Uh, this is her new book. So um, check them out because they're, they're wonderful stories and Deborah's a wonderful writer and we are so glad you joined us. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure and such a good conversation. I'm yes. so glad you had me on. Really Thanks, enjoyed Jess. it. All right. Bye, everybody. We'll see you again later on Read Science. Take care, y'all.